Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Brand new in the Christian Heritage series is William Perkins, A Reformed Catholic, with a wonderful introduction from Dr. Joseph Piper. Today, Christians think of the Roman Catholic Church as the oldest, most ancient form of Christianity. Evangelicals are often apathetic about their Christian heritage and see little difference between themselves and Roman Catholic. In Reformed Catholic, Puritan theologian William Perkins both shows that it is possible to genuinely respect Christian tradition and to disagree with the errors of Roman Catholicism. This book is not a debate over subtle points of doctrine, but over issues that continue to divide Christians to this day. You can get a Reformed Catholic by William Perkins with an introduction from Dr. Joseph Piper at canonpress.com. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 197. Episode 197. So last time in the in the previous podcast, I talked a little bit about theocracy and free speech, and I want to continue on a related theme with this with this one. I want to talk a little bit about the relationship of Old Testament law to today. What is the relationship of Old Testament law? And I'm talking about the relationship of Old Testament law to an obedient magistrate who is wanting to know how, uh, how we should configure our laws today. Does the Old Testament have anything to say to us? And I would say yes, but here are some important qualifiers. The Old Testament law, the Mosaic Code, is a case law system. It's a case law system. And what, it, what that means is you are given certain cases and certain determinations on those cases, and the judges, who presumably are God-fearing men who hate covetousness and so forth, are expected to look at those cases, extract the principle from those cases, and then apply the principle to the situation they are now in. This is distinct. This approach, this case law system, is the system that shaped the United States. One of the things that King Alfred did when he united England, he was the first king of a united England, one of the things that Alfred did was he took basically the laws of Deuteronomy and made them the laws of England. Now, England at that time was a, an agrarian society that would have a lot more in common with ancient Israel than it would have with us today. So, uh, the agrarian law of an agrarian people found in Deuteronomy fit more or less like a glove when he applied it to England. But here's the, this is the thing, and this is probably the, the important thing to remember. It wasn't that King Alfred took the laws of Deuteronomy and just ratcheted them down on top of England. Rather, he took the legal system. The legal system, which I said a moment ago, is a case law system. What he did is he brought that system over. And what that meant was England adopted a case law system. Our name for that case law system is common law. Our name for a case law system is common law. Now, in the United States, uh, 49 of our 50 states are common law states. The one exception is Louisiana, and Louisiana isn't common law state because Louisiana was settled by the French or established by the French. And the, the Napoleonic Code was their legal system. And that was a variation on the, the Justinian Code, which is the other legal system. And just, with a Justinian law code, what you try to do is anticipate every contingency, every eventuality. You try to anticipate everything and say what's allowed and what's not allowed. In a case law system or a common law system, you don't do that. So here's the expectation. A judge hears a case. Let's say a, a, there's a widow lady in Sussex whose dog eats the neighbor's chicken. And that case winds up in small claims court. The dog eats the neighbor's chicken. The judge makes a determination that the lady, the widow, owes her neighbor a chicken, uh, plus, let's say, a small 
fine or something because she let the dog out. Now, 20 years later, down the road in the next village over, you have a case where a farmer's bull gores his neighbor's dog. Now, in the first situation, the dog was the aggressor. In the second situation, the dog is the victim. Uh, but what the, what the judge in the second system does, being a wise judge, is he looks at the first case, and on the basis of the precedent it sets, he takes that principle, and he, apply, he extracts the principle, and he applies the principle to a new and different situation. Now, this is why, for example, uh, when people ask me if I'm a theonomist, first I joke and say, oh, no, I, I hate God's law. And then they say, well, you know what I mean. I say, well, I'm, I would describe myself as a Westminster Confession theonomist. Westminster Confession Theonomist. The Westminster Confession says the Old Testament law is divided up into three different categories. There's the moral law, there's the ceremonial law, and there's the judicial law. The moral law is binding, permanent. The ceremonial law was fulfilled in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And the judicial law, the Westminster theologians said, only applied to the nation of Israel and ceased with the cessation of that nation of Israel, except, they said, as the general equity thereof may require. That general equity is the principle that a case law system or that a common law system runs on, general equity. So what Paul is doing when he says you should pay your minister, you you should pay your minister because the law says you shall not muzzle the ox when it treads out the, the grain, what he's doing is he's extracting the general equity from the case on oxen and applying it to ministers, right? Or if someone said, um, why do you believe that women shouldn't go into combat? Uh, I would say, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Extract the general equity. That which God gave for life, for giving life, milk, shall not be turned into the instrument of death. Women are life givers. They're not death dealers. And so you extract the general equity and you apply that. So the relationship of Old Testament law is fine if you bring across the system and not just the particular laws. You have to bring, a, you have to bring across the legal system, the way the, the specifics are treated, and not simply the content of those laws. Carrying on with episode 197 in the podcast, we're once again, we've come to our hamartiology class. And we hope that these studies are helping you to understand your internal adversaries better, and that in this class, you are staying out of the practicums. So, we come now to our next sin, which is discostasia. Discostasia. This is rendered in two places as divisions, and in one place as seditions. So, for some reason, some people thrive on stirring up trouble and strife. When it comes to church splits, they are a one-man starter kit. They know how to do it. Paul says to avoid that kind of person, identify them, and avoid them. He says this in Romans 16, 17. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions. There it is. There's our word. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So, he says, identify and avoid. Mark and stay away. We are to take the apostolic doctrine and hold it up next to the person who is agitating for this or that. If it doesn't measure up, if what he's saying doesn't measure up, then give that person a wide berth. This is not unfriendliness, it is obedience. It's not unfriendliness, it is obedience. When a church is not walking in the Spirit, it is an open invitation to this kind of thing. When people are uh, letting that crackle develop between them and and others, uh, what happens? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is yet among you envying and strife and divisions, there's our word, and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So, in context, this is a description of the Corinthians lining up behind their most favorite teachers, whether it's Paul or Peter or Apollos. It's still carnal even if your main guy is a New Testament Bible teacher. So, there's nothing wrong with any of those teachers, Paul or Peter or Apollos. They were all godly men, right? But Paul says there is something wrong with the way you're attaching to them, the way you're uh, aligning your allegiance to them. 
So you can't justify your divisions by the godliness of the person whose name you're using as a banner. And then, in a list of sins given in Galatians, we find this, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, there's our word, heresies. So, pagans hate each other. Pagans go at each other's throats. Pagans don't like each other. And one of the things that is characteristic of them is this tendency to divide, this tendency to get into an uproar. It cannot be emphasized enough that to divide from someone who causes division is not the sin of division, and it's not hypocrisy. Paul says to mark them, identify them, and avoid them. When I'm avoiding a divider, when I'm avoiding a divisive man, I'm not being divisive. So, when I stay away from someone who's got a virulent case of the flu, I am not guilty of having the flu. I'm avoiding catching it. So, there are certain things you have to avoid, certain kinds of people you have to avoid. It's not the sin of division to ostracize the one who would cause division. Here we are, episode 197 in the podcast. The book I want to review is a short little book by Thomas Goodwin, a Puritan, and the book is called The Return of Prayers. The Return of Prayers. I forgot the name of the publisher. It's a short little book, and there are two other books by two other Puritans that they published alongside it. There's, it's like a, a trilogy of small books on prayer. One of them is called Importunity, and I've forgotten the name of the other one. They're all on prayer. And as I've read Christian teaching on prayer, there, there's a lot of good stuff there, obviously. But when, when I read Thomas Goodwin here, it, it's the sort of thing that makes you realize that they were simply living on a higher level, higher plane. They, they asked and answered questions that sometimes it's, it's very common. Sometimes it's the same sort of questions we would ask or answer. But other times, they just get into things that make me realize that they had much more experience uh, with this. One of the, I'll give you one takeaway that I got from this book. The title, The Return of Prayers, one of the things he's urging is for Christians to keep track of answers to their prayers, to keep track of answers to their prayers. If we don't, this is uh, part of um, one of the conclusions, it is just as likely that God might answer a prayer, I might note it in passing, and then forget about it, than it is that God would simply ignore my prayer entirely. So, what's more likely, God not answering you at all, or God answering you and you forgetting, or, or not memorializing it, or not remembering? And Goodwin goes on at some length, saying, you need to mark the returns on your prayers. Keep track. Keep track of the things that God has blessed you with in his answers. When God has given you a remarkable uh, turn of events, don't just say, oh, that was wonderful, and feel warm for the rest of the day, because by the middle of next week, you may well have forgotten all the details of that answered prayer, or forgotten that God answered your prayer. Goodwin says we should study our answers to prayer. We should remember our answers to prayer. We should mark them. And as we do, we are learning to pray more efficiently. We're learning to pray more biblically. We're learning to pray more. Uh, we're getting to know God such that we know and understand his, um, what sorts of things he likes to answer, what sorts of things he likes to say yes to, what sorts of things he says no to. It helps us calibrate our prayers. So, th there are many, many good uh, nuggets in this short little book, The Return of Prayers. And if you, you can tell it's the edition I'm, I'm thinking of. If on Amazon, it's got a brown cover, and the other, the other two books in the trilogy have a brown cover also. It's very clearly a matching set. Mm -hmm.